Finally, we are going to deal with basic feasible solutions that do not have as many non-zero entries as there are elements in the basis that determine them. Such a solution is called degenerate. We'll first look at an example. Say this is my matrix A, it's a 2 by 4 matrix with full row rank. B is this vector here. It's not difficult to see that x star equal to 0, 0, 2, 0 is a solution to a x equal to b x greater than 0. And in fact, it is a basic feasible solution determined by any one of these three bases 1, 3, 2, 3, or 3, 4. The fact that there are multiple bases determining this basic feasible solution causes some complication. The reason is because we are trying to work with extreme points, but we don't really work with extreme points directly. We use bases that determine basic feasible solutions. So, in order to restore some kind of one to one correspondence, what we'll do is try to avoid having degenerate basic feasible solutions in the first place. And what we are going to do is we are going to nudge things a little bit. So, we're going to perturb the constraints. And let me just illustrate by a very simple example. Suppose I have a picture that looks like this that defines my feasible region. And if you look at this intersection point here, uh, it's an intersection of these two lines, or these two lines, or these two lines. So there are three ways to define this point via intersection of two lines. But if I nudge these inequalities a little bit, so I'm going to move every inequality a little bit, then I will have an extra point, but I don't have the ambiguity of the intersections anymore. Every one of these red points in the feasible region is uniquely determined by the intersection of two of these lines. So the idea of perturbation is the same. We nudge the constraints a little bit. The goal is to eliminate degeneracy. So how do we do that? In this example, we'll try to change the right-hand side so that the basic feasible solution we are dealing with is 2 plus epsilon and epsilon squared, where epsilon is a very small positive number. And if that's the case, then the basis that determines x star is uniquely determined is going to be 3, 4. Now, how much do we need to perturb b? Well, if this is my solution, then a x star uh, better be uh, 2 plus epsilon, 4 plus 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared. Right, so if I multiply things out, it will be this. So the perturbation that, so the perturbation that we need is going to be uh, epsilon and two epsilon plus epsilon squared. So that will give me a perturbed system. All right. So in general, given a x equal to b and x greater than zero, and b uh, basis determining a basic feasible solution, uh, we form the system ax equal to b prime x greater than zero, where b prime is simply b plus the matrix with columns indexed by b times this vector epsilon epsilon square and so on up to epsilon to the m for some sufficiently small epsilon bigger than zero now there is a reason why we choose the perturbation like this uh, powers of epsilon where epsilon is some not yet specified positive quantity and it turns out that this choice has a very nice property, is that if I take another basis, 
that determines a basic feasible solution for this new system. It will also determine a basic feasible solution for the original system. So what that means is as follows. Let B prime be a basis determining a basic feasible solution of a x equal to b prime x greater than zero. The claim is b prime also determines a basic feasible solution of the original system. The significance of this claim will come useful later. What basically we are trying to do is we are going to solve this LP problem by solving the perturbed problem instead. And if you think about it, solving this problem will end up with a basic feasible solution that is optimal. And of course, we would hope that the basis that determines that will also determine a basic feasible solution for the original system without the B prime. And we will also hope that that basis would determine the optimal solution for this problem without the prime. So this is a step towards that. So let's prove this claim. First of all, it suffices to show that the inverse of a sub b prime times b is non-negative because that will give us the variables for the basic variables given by the basis b prime. And if they are non-negative, then we have a basic feasible solution. The fact that b prime determines a basic feasible solution of a x equal to b prime comma x greater than equal to zero means a sub b prime inverse times b prime is non-negative. This implies that, of course, b plus a b prime inverse times a sub b times these epsilon is non-negative. If we look at this, this is a column vector, and this thing collectively is a column vector in which every entry has a positive power of epsilon as a factor. And epsilon, remember, is very, very small. So if any of these is negative, say, say the first component here is negative, then there's no way we can make up for that negative value by these powers of epsilon to make it non-negative, right? So if the first component is, say, minus 0 0.01, well, remember that epsilon is very, very, very small. So small that it will be insignificant compared to 0 0.1. In that case, this is not possible, provided we choose epsilon small enough. So the only way this is satisfied is to have all these components to be non-negative. Now obviously, uh, the choice of epsilon will depend on what's in here. But there are only finitely many values that can appear in, in the front here because we have only finitely many bases. So presumably, we can choose epsilon so small that no matter what b prime is, uh, the column vector here will never make up for any possible negative value that appears here. And that basically is the proof. Now, there's another important fact. So in fact, a prime, b prime is greater than zero. Now, let's see why this is the case. So let's bring it up here. The j entry looks like this. It will be some constant plus another constant times first power of epsilon plus another constant times the second power of epsilon and so on. Another constant times the nth power of epsilon. All right. So if you expand this, uh, the entry will look like this. So when is this equal to zero. Now remember that epsilon is very, very, very small. 
Okay. For example, if alpha zero is non-zero, then all these terms at the back would not be able to make up for the difference to make it zero. So alpha zero has to be zero. But once you have that, well, epsilon is positive, so we can divide both sides by epsilon, and then we end up with alpha one plus alpha two times epsilon to the one plus, and then and so on, plus alpha m to the epsilon m minus one equal to zero. Again, epsilon is very small, right? So in order for this to be zero, alpha one cannot be non-zero, and so on. So you can use this argument to conclude that it is zero, if and only if all these things are zero. So the only way to have this zero is to have alpha zero, alpha one, plus all the way alpha m to zero. But what this means is that this matrix here has a zero row. So the only way to have alpha one up to alpha m equal to zero is for the matrix to have a zero row. And that's impossible because both a sub b and a sub b prime inverse are invertible. So when you take the product, the product is also invertible and you cannot have a zero row. And so we can conclude that any basic feasible solution of the system ax equal to b prime comma x greater than zero must be non-degenerate. In other words, all the basic variables will have to have positive values. And that is a very important fact. And this is a fact that we'll exploit in the next video when we discuss how to put together a version of the simplex method.